we have to be here tonight, to be concerned about things that are going on in our lives and in the lives of others, especially like Rob Orr, whose family has recently received a loss of the passing of his father. We pray, Father, that as he continues to, and the entire family continues to face the times that are ahead, that they will have good courage inside of you, Father. We're thankful, Father, for all the blessings that we have, for all the health that we have. We pray, Father, at this time a very special prayer that we will be able to retain our health and keep our health, knowing, Father, that we have a very important work to do here on this earth as commanded of you. And we pray, Father, that we will take our work here on this earth seriously in helping others know about you. We know, Father, from time to time things happen in our world that are very tragic, and we pray, Father, at this time for something that has been on uh, my mind and the minds of several of the people throughout the state of Tennessee in this area, uh, for a little boy who had fell in, fell in the pool this week and is in Vanderbilt, uh, the Swims family, Father, and we pray that as they're there with him, that they will be able to get the treatment that he needs and to be able to have the courage and the strength to be there with their son as he's in the hospital. So thankful, Father, for our health, for all the wonderful things that we have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I meant to mention this as we started, but a friend of mine who was in Memphis School of Preaching with me, his son, who was two, fell in their pool, um, and they found him sometime after, um, and he is in Vanderbilt now. Um, so they're, they're keeping up with him. So that family, uh, they, they're in McMinnville now as he works with the Central Congregation there, but keep that family in your prayers, the Swims family. Uh, my son also is at home sick. He has an ear infection, decided to catch up on one of those. That seems to be the thing for children, but keep him, keep Colston in your prayers as well. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and you just go ahead and be turning there, and we'll pick up in this particular section and be able to get to where we need to get in this particular section, talking about the roles that we're in. Remember, our objective of this class is to pay attention to the roles and learn our behaviors inside of the church, inside of the Lord's church with all of our various roles. So we've looked at several things that Paul has written to Timothy and throughout the chapters of things Timothy can do. He's exhorted all men to live as they should. And now as we turn and we make our way into 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're starting tonight in verses 9 and 10, of which we ended last week, that talks about some things that I believe are rather interesting. And I believe that maybe possibly we don't give a lot of attention to anymore. I think there are various reasons behind that. I believe that really is irrelevant. But just read with me 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, and it'll set the scenes for where we're going to study tonight. Reads this way, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. You know, anytime you come to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and you, you make your way down to verse 9, you see that word modest there. And usually inside of this particular discussion, you'll have a discussion on modesty. Now, usually when we go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, what type of modesty is being talked about? Decent in which way? Think about this for just a minute, because modesty is, is, is a multifaceted word. I think that's a lot of it. Okay. So it has to do with clothing, we're starting to understand. Because, you know, you can be modest in your speech, can't you? And shouldn't we be, as Christians, modest in our speech? Um, you can be modest in the way you spend your money. Have you ever thought about that? That is a facet of modesty. Uh, you can be modest in the way that you live in your life. And, and you can be modest in a, in, a, in a whole group of areas of which you could be. But I think in 1 Timothy chapter 9, or chapter 2, verse 9, it, it sets the stage for us. In like manner also, in other words, with the same things he's been talking about in the previous section, with the same authority he's been talking about, he says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves. Now, what does the word adorn mean? Wear, put on. That's the way I always like to look at the word adorn. You put on something, so we already on the face of it know what we're talking about to a degree. Now, 
I believe with Jimmy as well, this is not just talking about singularly in what we wear or what we categorically do not wear in the idea of trying to provoke a sexual nature in that way. I believe it's talking about that. But I believe this is a much deeper discussion than just what is not being worn. But I believe it also has to do with what is being put on inside of the body. In other words, what others are seeing. That's right, showy. Flashy, there we go. We're getting it there. Now we're right where we want to be. So he tells them to adorn themselves in modest apparel. I I believe I can say this with, with all degree of assurance that every person in this room knows what is modest just as much as we know what is immodest. Now, the question becomes, how do we define those two particular phrases? And listen to this, where do we apply those particular phrases? What's being described in this chapter? If you go back up to verse 8, read read, read verse 8 with me. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Go into verse 9, in like manner also, he says that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. What do you think the context of those two statements are? Are they private or public in what's taking place in those two statements? I believe they're public. I believe they're public. I do. Now... Here's something that I believe we need to say. And just think about this with me for a minute. Is modest apparel applied in every situation of life? No, the answer is no. Usually we want to say the answer is yes. And I understand the intent behind that. Because when we go out in public, shouldn't we be modest? Let me ask you this question. Are we always in public? Now, I'm not saying that we can be immodest in front of other people as long as it's not in public. But are there ever occasions where the body is shown in front of someone else that would be immodesty outside in the public eye? Of course, in the marital relationship, isn't that true? So we're not talking about a standard of modesty that is always put into effect, that always exists and never can be any different. We're talking about things in public. Now, don't draw that line to say as long as it's in private we can be immodest. That's not what I'm saying either. But just understand that he's talking about here, and I believe he's talking about those when they're out in the public eye. Just like the men that pray everywhere is the same occasion that when women are out, they should be modest. And there's two facets of that. Number one, in what they wear and what they do not wear. We understand modesty in what we do not wear. It's inappropriate for both men and women to show the body in in a modest fashion. Isn't that true? Now, let me just ask you something that I believe is, is true to a degree. But why are women being addressed with modesty? I think that's a part of it. I do. I do. But why? Think about it. Why? Yes, sir. Okay. And that is a good example. The award shows on television. How how are the women dressed? Barely, I think is a good definition. Is that a good definition? How are the men dressed? How are the men dressed? In a tuxedo, and their neck's not even shown. Which one is modest and which one is immodest? Well, the men are being modest, aren't they? And the women are being immodest in their dress. I'm just telling you something. Usually, I'm not saying this is always the case, but usually men don't have a problem with modesty. I've never been out with another man who's a Christian or otherwise and thought, boy, I wish you'd put some more clothes on. Because usually that's not a problem for men when they go out. Now, is it possible for a man to be immodest in public eye? Of course it is. What if a man went fishing in a tuxedo? Well, I'd wonder how he survived. (laughs) There you go. That's it. There you go. It can be possible for a man to be immodest. But usually when we talk about it, who are we talking about? 
Well, the same thing is being talked about here. Because usually it's, it's, it's not a problem for men to be modest dressed. That, that's usually not an issue. But, but it is a very big issue for women to be immodest. Now, I'm not saying you're choosing to be immodest in this particular occasion, but just think about it. Statistically speaking, normally who is likely or more likely to be immodest? So just bring that into your minds for just a minute. And I believe it has to do with the, the way men are. Now, I'm not saying that a man cannot turn his eyes. Because he can. Usually in the modesty discussion, someone will say that we need to be modest because men are weak. And I understand what's being said. And I'm not saying that about what you said. I think it's true. But I think that's a crutch. Yes, there you go. Well, I ask people this, this particular question. If you went to go see the president, what would you wear? What would you wear? To go see what's been defined as the most powerful man in the world, what would you wear? Ah, you'd be in good taste. That's right. But see, it's in the regular part of life that sometimes we're not in good taste for various reasons. But you have to see in this particular occasion, he's addressing ladies because who is in control of this? Who's in control of the way everyone dresses? The individual. There we go. Now, principle number one. I believe that if someone is in modest in front of you, you have a way to leave. Just, just remember that. If something filthy is in front of you, you, you don't have to partake in that. If someone brought you a mud pie, would you eat it? No. Well, it was a pie. You, you would if you're hungry. <laughs> we understand it in other areas, but remember, we are in control of what we do. So, so point number one, we're in control in what we wear and what we see and what we continue to see. But number two inside of this, we need to recognize that modesty is a two-way street. There is modesty, and there is what I call ultra-modesty. Now, I believe there's something past modesty, and that's immodesty. We're not talking about that, just modesty. There is modesty, there's a way to be modest. And then there's a way to take it too far. In everything in life, things can be taken to the left and to the right. Isn't that true? In, in everything in life. And, and the same is true about this particular scene. This particular verse is not saying that women have to be different than men. That's not what it's saying. Because all should be modest. But it is approaching a problem that is more prevalent in the world. It's interesting to me that in the time this was written, this was a problem. And would you say it's still a problem? And I want to say this, it probably still will be a problem in 50 more years. But it doesn't have to be a problem for us, does it? No. The same is true in the way we communicate. Think about this for a minute. If we're modest in our communication, are there foul words in this world that the Christian should never use? Well, the answer is yes. Do we hear those foul words sometimes when we're in public? Yes, but that doesn't mean you don't have to use them. So you're in control of what's going on in your life. You see, usually in certain areas, you know, you, you, you take our speech. We don't have as big of a problem with that. But this one does seem to bother us sometimes, I believe, because it's a big issue in our world. So you have people who are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now follow along and see what he says. With shamefacedness and sobriety. The word shamefacedness is a sense of shame and prevents any shameful act. Which goes on to what we were talking about a minute ago. What we do matters. And what we do is going to influence others. And there are actions in this life that are shameful. What, what does immodesty usually lead to? Use the biblical word. Sin, but get specific. Lust, what else? Let's follow it through. Lust, fornication, or even adultery. 
So where does this go to? Is, is premarital sex or extramarital sex shameful in our world? Not in our world, it doesn't seem to be. Yes, it, it does have that. Yes, sir. That's right where we're drawing. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. We've become to see these things as commonplace, haven't we? Um, in our daily lives, it's kind of become common. In, in television and film, hasn't it become common to see these type of things? And before we know it, won't it become common in our lives? Because remember, what goes in will come out. So, so the idea here in shamefacedness is not to be involved in acts of shame. And just as was said a moment ago, to blush is the idea. You know, sobriety also is a word that means the result of self-restraint. The result of self-restraint, which tells you and me something about modesty. Who's in control of this? The individual. You are. I am. We are all in control of this. So he says, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now go on and see what he says. Not with broided hair. What's broided hair? Braided. Not with a fancy hairdo. Is it possible that with hair we can call attention to ourselves? It is, isn't it? Now, let me ask you a question. Is he saying you can't braid your hair? Hold your answer for just a minute. All right, next one, with braided hair, with gold. Anybody wearing gold tonight? Is he saying you can't wear gold? Well, what's he saying here? Can gold or jewelry be used to accentuate and draw the eyes to a particular part of the body? Ah, we go back to that word lust we used a minute ago. What about pearls? Pearls. It's wrong to have pearls. On my wedding day, I got Kelly a gift, and I got her two, a set of pearl earrings and had them delivered to her before our wedding. Is it wrong to have pearls? There you go. There you go. And that's what I think he's doing in this next, next phrase, or costly array. There you go, it does. That's right. We know what happens when someone is not sober, don't we? And we also know what it means when someone is sober. So he's not saying we cannot have hair that is taken care of. We cannot have gold or pearls or costly array. But when we use these things to draw out the body because of immodesty. Get the idea? Is there anything wrong with a gold ring? No. But when I use these things to draw to self, he goes on and says, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Uh, ladies, what is your number one goal in life? There you go. To go to heaven. And that's exactly what he's saying here. Which becometh women professing godliness. If we're going to be godly in the way we live... It's going to affect all areas of our lives. Now, usually when you get into this modest discussion, people like to set standards for what is modest and what is not. I think we understand modesty, don't we? I think if something draws someone to lust, then I don't need to be doing it. I think that's just, just, just a good rule of thumb. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Whether it be my clothes, whether it be my hair, that's strange, isn't it? Ladies, is that strange to your, to your ears? I'm going to say something and I don't want it to be misappropriated when I say it, but it's not strange to a man's ears. Man understands that. I, 
That's why I said I'm not going to sit here and get into situations tonight. Because when you open up that door, what we start doing is setting standards in our conversation and we miss what the text is saying. Here's what the text is saying. We should do nothing that detracts from godliness. That's not just in our clothing or our jewelry. That's in our lives. And that's what he's saying here. And he adds something to it that I really enjoy. Matter of fact, the, verse, the, the passage would be much different if this wasn't there. With good works. What should we be doing? We should be involved in good works. What's the greatest work in this world? Telling someone about heaven, about Jesus. So there we go. Because if we're doing something separate to that, it changes our motive inside of this life. Now, when we move from verse 10 and we go into verse 11 and 12, it's almost as if we hit controversial passage after controversial passage. That's right. That's right. That's right. I agree with you. I agree wholeheartedly there. That's right. That's right. I think that's. I think that's right. I think that's what both y'all are saying. Is what all we're, all of us were saying there. When he moves here. You, you leave 9 and 10, you go to 11 and 12. Controversial passage over to controversial passage. Now, just read with me 11 and 12. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer, a woman, or I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, some people would say, look, God is trying to silence women is that true? The answer to that is no. Get the context of what's taking place here. In the, in the context of what's taking place has to do with the learning of God's Word. The preaching of God's Word. Can we talk about inside the church? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I would suggest um, that's exactly what you're talking about. Um, especially when you go back to the beginning of what was happening, um, when you go back up to the beginning section, talking about the church, talking about the preaching of Christ. Yes, I would think so. That's right. I agree with you. 
Um, and Yes. Yeah, all, all this. I agree. Yes. Um, let me ask you a question. Let me just open up a can. You ever opened a can of worms? Well, so far tonight, some of our ladies have spoken. Was there wrong there? Yes, I agree, Ho. I agree with you there. I, I'm just asking. I'm just asking for you to think. I'm just trying to get you to think here. Agree wholeheartedly with you. I agree. And I'm going to add something to that in just a minute. That's where I was. We were going to get there in just a minute. And that's why I said I was going to. Now, who is leading this class? All right. Who is not leading this class? We are. See the difference of what's happening here? Now, if the authority were usurped, in other words, ladies, if one of you tried to take over the class, would that be wrong? Oh, yes, it would be. It would be. God does not try to silence women, neither does God try to make women cover themselves up in a stifling fashion, verses 9 and 10. And think about this for just a minute. If, if, I'm not saying it does, I'm saying it doesn't, but if it were saying that women had to remain silent completely, how could they sing? Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's right. It's about context here, about what's taking place. Yes, sir, not in a worship service. Yes, sir. Nor in official class setting as we are in tonight. But, but look at what happens here. In the assembly of God's people, let the women or the women learn in silence with all subjection. You go to the word silence that's used here in verse 11, and you can find this used also in 1 Corinthians 14:34. And it's from a Greek word that means absolute silence. What does absolute anything mean? Absolute silence. What's that mean? None. Zero. Not a bit. I agree with you in that devotional type period because there is a purpose behind that. There is a purpose behind worship. There's a purpose behind this class, isn't there? There's a purpose behind everything in life. But inside of these public assemblies that are considered worship and in this particular scene, they are to be in silence in the context of public authoritative teaching. Now, I can't say completely in public speaking because if I say it's totally referring to public speaking, ladies, you can't sing in the service. And if I restrict you from singing in the service, what am I causing you not to do? Causing you not to worship in song. No, you couldn't have any of these things. If you're saying that a woman cannot teach, and if that's true, our classes in the back are sinful because who's teaching primarily Minus one class tonight. The ladies are teaching those classes in the appropriate manner of what's going on. Silence. This is a word that means complete silence. 
He says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Yes. Yes, ma'am. That's right. That's right. That's right. I haven't either. Not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over what? Now, is that God saying that men are better than women? Because some people would say that from this passage. Some people would try to say that God's saying men are better than women. That's not what God is saying, is it? It's God's plan for worship. It's God's plan, listen to this, the way I'm going to put this, for salvation. It's God's plan for the church. Hey, God's plan, especially when you add this word authority, it's God's plan for the home. That's a good way to look at it. That's right, God's order. You know, our world is very interesting. Now listen to what I'm going to say, and don't take me out of context. I believe a woman can do anything a man can do. Sometimes better. But that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it right. And our world has taught us that if we think it's right, then it's right. And therefore, you have the denominational world, which ignores this passage, especially inside of verse 12. I believe the but I suffer is not only a blanket restriction referring to the situations at hand, but also shows us what God expects. But I suffer not a woman to teach. Where? In the assembly. Once again, if he's saying teach in every scenario, then we've got a problem tonight. Then we have a problem in this room tonight because some of y'all have been speaking. I don't believe that's what he's referring to. If we're saying that it has to do with every situation of life, then in Titus chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, where the women are told to teach the younger women, that means they couldn't teach there either. So is God contradicting himself? The answer is no. It has to do with this particular middle phrase. And this is a phrase that our world just does not like. Nor usurp the authority over the man. Very possible. Nor to usurp the authority over the man. Has God created an order inside of the home? Yes. Has God created an order inside of the church? Let me tell you, that's not new today. In the beginning, with man and woman, were the roles not different? Remember, our objective of this class is to learn how to behave within our roles within the Lord's church. Do you want to know why there will never be a female preacher in the combined assemblies in this place? Do you want to know why? Because God has an order. And God has told us over and over and time and time again what He says, let all things be done, passages like this, let all things be done decently and in order. God has an order to things. Just as much as he does in the home as he does inside of the church. Nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why is this? Think about this for a minute. Why is this? Well, usually when we ask why, in a Bible passage such as this, this is 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, 
the answer is given somewhere in that chapter. Well, for here the answer is given. And we've already answered it without really answering it. It's in 13 and 14. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Just, just look at verse 13 for just a minute. It has to do with order. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. God has an order to all things. The reason given was a subordinate role that God instilled in creation. Verses 12 or 11 and 12 goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Why is that the case? Because that's the design and the order of God, not the design and order of man. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, God's design. But he goes on and tells us more about this in this particular section. He says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You know, these restrictions also are not characteristic of our world nor the pagan day of which they lived in when 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 were penned. Our world has no order. Not in every situation it does not. Their world had no order and not in every situation. But God had placed order inside of this world. You know, the Bible's restrictions concerning women are not representative of the times, but are distinctive in this manner. It calls men to look at God's original plan for the relative roles of man and women, back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Now, in all of this, he keeps giving us details inside of verse 15. Play it out all the way through verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Although women or women in total are given the subordinate role in certain affairs in life, if she fulfills her God-given roles, which is being characterized or symbolized here by childbearing, she will be saved. If she is as God designed her, that's what it means. It does not mean that a woman will be saved if she has a child. That would make God a respecter of persons, wouldn't it? God is no respecter of persons, we know. And if God is saying women can only be saved inside of childbearing, what happens to the woman that's barren? What happens to the woman who is unmarried? Do you have to be married to go to heaven? No. No. I think it does have some reference to that. Yes, I do. Um, but, but I think it goes back to the order of, of what things, and I think it brings our minds all the way back to Genesis because if childbearing did not exist, who could not exist? The human race, but go further than that. If childbearing did not exist, then who could not exist? Christ! Yes, it does. I agree wholeheartedly with you. There you go. The role. That's exactly what he's saying. The role inside of what's happening. Now he says this. If they continue, that's very important. Now, for us, unfortunately, the bell has rung and we have three minutes to get what's at least going to take us ten minutes to do. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to pick up inside of verse 15 as we start next week's class. Now what's good about that is... It is how the class is going to go inside of what we're doing. Because as we go into 1 Timothy chapter 3, you already know this, but what comes in verse 1? This is a true saying. What's the rest of that? What's going to be talked about in chapter 3, the first part of that chapter? Yes, but, but the roles of which we fulfill. Remember our objective of this class? To learn how to live within our roles. Some of those roles are going to be talked about when we roll into chapter 3. Now, interestingly enough, faith, charity, holiness, and sobriety are the backbones of what we're going to study about in chapter 3. Whether you're talking about the word found in verse 1, bishop or elder, 
or you follow on down into verse 8, likewise must the deacons, it's going to have to do with faith, charity, holiness, and also sobriety. And we'll see that when we pick up next week uh, right here in verse 15. And we will carry this out inside of these areas. And then we'll roll into chapter 3. And we will have a handout of sorts next week when you come into class. Um, I will put them here for sure. I'll try to put some on the back. But if you don't see any in the back, get you one here up front. Uh, there will be a handout that's going to go with all of the characteristics and qualities found in chapter 3. And what we're going to notice in that handout is that all of those characteristics are very important. And I'll show you why next week in that handout. So get your handout when you come next week. And we'll pick up in verse 15 as we finish out these last few things. And we'll roll into chapter 3 next week. Thank you so much.